to know a saving grace of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about some of those people in our sermon series today. The Apostle Paul became as diligent, and probably even more so, in the pushing, in the, in the preaching of the gospel, as he was in the extermination attempt of it. Paul, to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, and let us see what we have here. Just want to make sure that everything is all right. And where are we on live, Isaac? Uh, well, now, but... Oh, okay. So we're good? Okay. Um, we're going to be talking about the impossible possibilities of God. The Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. And I love Paul, who started life as Saul of Tarsus, who became as adamant and even more so in the pushing of the gospel, in the, in the presentation of the gospel as he wasn't trying to exterminate the church. The thing, one of the things, of the many things that Paul said that I really love, was Paul said, I am here, there's one thing I know, one thing I'm here to preach. I'm not here to preach about Paul, I'm not here to preach about a denomination or a church, I am here to preach Christ Jesus and him crucified, not the persuasive words of a man. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, according to the Apostle Paul, when I came to you, I did not come with the eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I love that free. I love that verse. I know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I have come not to persuade you with human words, but to tell you stories of the power of God. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We talk about the impossible possibilities of God, and we like to talk, when we witness to people on the street, we like to talk to people who are not Christians and who are questioning whether or not there is a God. And oftentimes they say this question. Well, I don't know if I really believe the Bible, and even if it was true, all that stuff happened way back then in the day. And does God really conduct business today? Does the Holy Spirit really do miracles in the world today? When Jesus was alive and people were questioning whether or not he was the Son of God, Jesus in John chapter 10 verse 38 said, Do not believe in me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe my words, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So Jesus was saying, If you don't believe the words I say, believe in the miracles I do. Which to me says that the reason to do miracles was a twofold reason. That he had grace and compassion as the Son of God to heal people. And we prayed for people to be healed uh, before the service today. But also he was saying, I am here to prove to you that I am the Son of God. And if you don't believe my proclamation of that, believe in dead men walking. Believe in Lazarus coming up from the tomb. Believing in the witness of of the miracle in Canaan where he turned water into wine, which was the first miracle that Jesus Christ did. I love that first miracle because it's a beautiful depiction of love and commitment. Jesus did this miracle out of step with his so-called plan. When the woman at the wedding came to him and said, Jesus, we're out of, we're out of wine, uh, but I know that you can do a miracle, and I know you can turn the water into wine. Jesus said, my time has not yet come in John chapter 2, verse 4, meaning that it wasn't time for him to proclaim that he was the Messiah, that there were some at the wedding that said, hey, you know, 
you know, watch this, you know, watch this thing. You can turn the water into wine. He is the son of God, and he's about ready to show you. Come on, Jesus, do it. And Jesus was saying, I have grace and compassion on the people at this wedding because it was terrible. It was a disgrace for them to run out of wine before the wedding feast was over. So in his grace and compassion, he stepped out of his timeline, so to speak, and did the miracle. But he didn't do it proclaim, to proclaim himself as the Messiah. He did it because of his grace and compassion on the presenters of the feast at the wedding. Because script, or tradition was that they would be um, disgraced in the public square if they ran out of wine. But I like the fact that the first miracle was a wedding. Because the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church is as a bridegroom and a bride. Jesus is the groom who gave his life for his bride. His bride serves the groom. And there's this beautiful picture of devotion, of commitment, of sacrifice, and of love, and of the two becoming one. So I love the fact that Jesus' first miracle of his 37 was the wedding at Cana. So back to our situation about, does Jesus still perform miracles today? Yes, he does. We are going to have a little bit of a history lesson today about things that have happened. Let's see if we can do this in a timeline. Um, let's talk about, I'm from the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. I was born and raised in Oregon. And we've all heard stories about the settlers going to the Oregon country from eastern United States. And as Paul Harvey says, it's time now for the rest of the story. Some people here may remember Paul Harvey. So back in the day of the early settlers, was God working then? I think you might be amazed at this next story. As Indians, Native Americans, were seeking what they called the Book of Heaven. I know a friend, a friend of mine in Oregon, he has um, the Roar Ministries, Restoring Oregon's Amazing Roots. And we're going to tell you about Oregon a little bit, which is typically a state you consider to be very liberal in its leanings today. But God had his hand on Oregon initially and in the settling of the Pacific Northwest. In 1832, four men of the Nez Perce and Bitterroot, Salish, or Flathead tribes journeyed to St. Louis and requested from resident William Clark for someone to bring them the Book of Heaven. Because you see, the chiefs of the Indian tribes had a vision from the Great Spirit. And in that vision, the chiefs were told that a white man will come under a white cloud and bring you the Book of Heaven. Seek this book. And the white cloud, I believe, was the Conestoga wagons. Remember the old pioneer wagons with the white billowing things as they were rolling across the prairie? They must have looked like to the Native Americans like a white cloud. So they came looking for the Book of Heaven, which we know as the Bible. It was prophesied in a dream to the Salish people. So it's interesting to me that part of the settlement of the American Northwest was because God's hand moved on two people groups to bring them together. Now we know that as the story goes on between the Native Americans and the uh, white settlers, that there was conflict, that things, bad things happened. But initially, as God brought these people together, the Native Americans had come looking for the Book of Heaven. Uh, this is online on the internet, but isn't it amazing to me that you've never heard this te taught in schools today? In schools in Oregon, we were never taught that. So this happened. So a man, uh, a, a pastor, brought the Book of Heaven to the Native American people. His name was Jason Lee. Jason Lee was one of the people that started the settlement of the Oregon country. And to this day, the, uh, the Willamette University had 
was initially started as the Oregon Institute. The Oregon Institute was started by Jason Lee to teach the settlers about education. To this day, Jason Lee is honored in Oregon history. You don't believe me? Go to Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. today. In Statuary Hall, each state has two statues representing those states and the history of those states. One of Oregon's statues is that of a pioneer preacher by the name of Jason Lee. He also started Willamette University. Jason Lee was instrumental in promoting the immigration to the Oregon country. And you cannot rewrite history. If you don't believe me, today, go to Statuary Hall, look for the Oregon statues, and read the panel underneath one of them, a man holding a Bible. His name is Jason Lee. So if you think Oregon is just uh, burning up in non-Christian teachings, look at their foundings, look at the past. And it isn't amazing, isn't it amazing that God in his love and grace and compassion moved on these Indian chiefs and told them to go get the book of heaven. I think that's incredible. Amen. So that's the first miracle I want to talk to you about. Answering the question, does God still move and does God still create miracles and does God, does God still bring people together? Does God still move supernaturally in the world today? That's the first story. The second story is a man by the name of Angus Buchan. If you've seen the movie Faith Like Potatoes, you'll know what I'm going to talk about. Angus Buchan was a hard-living, hard-talking, rough-talking, South African farmer with anger issues. And he had to move because of apartheid and uh, the whites and the blacks were fighting in South Africa and he had to move to another part of South Africa in order to survive. He tried to clear the land all by himself and just became totally exhausted psychologically, mentally, and physically. And uh, he had to take medication and his wife was yelling at him, you've got to do something because you're going to kill yourself and kill us. So out of desperation, he went to church because he ran out of other things to do to try to find peace in his tumultuous anger and mind and not knowing how to deal with things in the world and things in his life. He went to church, and God's Holy Spirit moved on him, and he gave his life to God at that church, and his life was forever changed. And as God moves, God moved and changed the life of one man and that replicated as he conducted his ministry in later times. Angus Buchan not only wanted to accept God for himself, he wanted to tell others about the saving grace of this man called Jesus. You gotta watch the movie Faith Like Potatoes. It is based on true events. So we're gonna quote from an uh, interview with Angus. And uh, the interviewer asked, now, one of the things that Angus Buchan did, there was actually three miracles that I can remember. One of them was a lady was hit by lightning and died. Angus Buchan prayed and brought her back to life. I think the most amazing miracle he was involved with was growing potatoes without water. The interviewer asked him in an interview recently, during the drought, you went and planted potatoes against scientists' recommendation. Have you ever felt fear about being so practical with your faith? Angus Buchan said, God told me to plant potatoes. And he told the people in South Africa, we're going to plant potatoes because God told me to, even though it's impossible in man's reasoning, it's very possible with God. And to prove it, we're going to plant potatoes. And so that's what he did. Angus says they were talking about El Nino coming, the rain. There were notices, or lack of rain. There were notices in the newspaper and they spoke on the radio, especially to the marginal farmers and small peasant farmers, don't plant anything because it's not going to rain. Only plant your best fields. So what everybody was saying was, in man's way, do not plant uh, marginal crops, especially do not plant potatoes. Angus, don't plant potatoes. You will lose your farm, you will lose your family. Are you crazy? Are you nuts? Don't do it. Angus says, I just felt the Holy Spirit told me, go for it. So I doubled up. I had no irrigation, and you don't plant potatoes in South Africa without irrigation. It's just not done. Because if you get a dry spell, it can ruin your crop. 
Angus says, I planted those potatoes in raw faith and I made a great statement. If you remember from the film at the rugby stadium, I went up and I said, I'm going to plant potatoes. And that's what he did. I'm going back to plant all my field and I'm going to plant potatoes. I did that and you know God, that's why I love him so much. I felt quite emotional just even talking about it now. God always honors faith. Not good works or anything like that, but faith. Real faith in a real God. God answers faith. What does it say in the Bible? To please God, you have to have faith. Whenever Jesus healed people, they'd say, Jesus, you healed me. You healed me. And Jesus would say, no, it was your faith that made you well. I said to the people, I'm putting my trust in the Lord, and yes, I died a thousand deaths. Every time there was a bit of a break in the weather and the potatoes started wilting a bit, I would be on my knees again. So Angus was talking about the struggle here. You know, you have this grandiose statement, God is alive and I'm planting potatoes. And, and then comes the practical walking it out, day after day, getting up and looking at the plants withering with no rain. And you're saying, God, help me here. I'm, I kind of put myself out there. I'm a, I'm a fool to the world. So help me. The plants are dying. I, and, and he got on his knees. I tell you, I have calluses on my knees. I used to have them on my hands, but now I have them on my knees because I was on my knees so much praying to God. That is a picture of what we in the Christian church need to be today. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the power of prayer in another example. But in Angus's example, he had calluses on his knees because he was on, hand, on, his, on his hand and knees so much. How many calluses do we have as the American church today? Are we on our knees so much that we have calluses on our knees? Um, let's see. I've, uh, I used to have them on my hands, but now I have them on my knees. Of course, as I'll, this is a spoiler alert, so if you haven't seen the movie, I kind of spoiled it for you, but you've got to kind of see the movie. It's a great movie. God gave us a bumper crop of potatoes. There came a day when it's, it's time to harvest. There's been no rain. God says it's time to harvest. They put the pitchforks in the ground, and they pulled up, and they had big, huge potatoes with no water. That's why the movie is called Faith Like Potatoes. Tell the people to plant potatoes. And what Angus is telling, and so he spent the rest of his life going across South Africa. He's got this big yellow bus, and he does evangelistic crusades in Africa, and he spent his life doing it because he's telling people to have faith in a real God. He's the Moses of the generation in South Africa saying, there is a God, and he hears your prayers, and he does impossible things. He does what, what, is, what is possible with God is impossible in the world. So he is the God of the impossibility, and he can do it. So we started doing other outrageous things, like owning the biggest tent in the world, and God filled it with men. They, have this, this, uh, they used to have this men's outreach in South Africa. Uh, what I've done by faith, Angus says, but by faith we booked all the World Cup soccer stadiums, eight of them. We booked them all in faith. We don't have any money. We had to come up with $16 million. The Lord has never let us down. We're already talking about it, and we are going out, and we are preaching the word of God and believing that God provides. So we've got to watch the movie Faith Like Potatoes. Let us, where are we on time today? Okay. Um, I love history. And forgive me, I also like uh, World War II history. I love great speeches. And we are going to be talking about something that happened in, actually two things that happened in World War II. We're going to talk about the Battle of Dunkirk. And we're going to talk, first of all, about the Battle of the Bulge. A World War II soldier during the Battle of the Bulge, James Money from Plant City, Florida, many of his killed, friends were killed during the battle. Now, if you remember, let me set the stage a little bit. Hopefully I can remember this. The Battle of the Bulge was fought because it was the last stand by the Third Reich, Nazi Germany, to try to break the will of the Americans. Uh, it was a counteroffensive as they were trying to get through the Allied lines. And they did in what was called a bulge. 
they actually broke through the lines and there was this bulge in the American lines and that's why it's called the Battle of the Bulge. And it was in the middle of winter, so it was terrible. James Money was one of the soldiers fighting in the Battle of the Bulge. Many of his friends were killed nearby. James was hit by a sniper's bullet. It hit a wallet next to his heart with a lock of his son's hair in the wallet. He put it there to remember his son. He was hit by the bullet. He looked down, and out of the bullet hole in his shirt was sticking out his son's hair. But the bullet didn't penetrate the wallet. It stopped it. They came under what's called friendly fire. He jumped up and waved his 4th Armored Division insignia. He didn't know who was shooting, but he said, Hey, it's James! And one of the fallen soldiers said, Hold the fire, I know that guy, he's a friend of mine. And James Money says to this day, he believes God's hand was on him because to his right and to his left, people were being blown out of their foxholes, and God saved him. And he believes in miracles, he believes in the power of God. So let's go to stay in World War II for a little bit, and let's talk about the story of Dunkirk. We've all heard about the Battle of Dunkirk, where the Nazi Germany pushed the English army to the French coastline, and were going to slaughter them. And the Nazi plan was to slaughter the English army, and then go across the English Channel and take over Britain, and then all of Europe would be Nazi Germany. God had a different plan. There were several miracles that happened in the Battle of Dunkirk. King George VI called for a national day of prayer because it was not going well for the English army. He didn't say why, but he said the entire nation, by edict of the king, must get on their knees and pray for God's deliverance from our enemies during World War II. So the entire nation, tens of thousands of people, flocked to the churches and prayed. Churches were packed, people were praying. Back at Dunkirk, the men were being pushed to the sea and praying for a miracle. The first miracle happened. The Nazi army, for some reason, stopped. They just stopped. They just quit going forward. That allowed the English army time to kind of coalesce and get their act together and get gathered at the, at the coastline for the next step. They didn't know what it was. They just knew that they were being beaten and they needed a miracle. So the Nazi army stopped. England was continuing to pray. The second miracle happened. Rain and clouds came out, and the dive bombers could no longer strafe the troops because they could not see them. And for some reason, the smoke from all the bomb detonations continued to swirl around the coastline, and the wind did not blow it away. It continued to obscure the view of the English from the Nazi dive bombers. So then... King George says, and it's interesting, Winston Churchill, I love Winston Churchill, but he was not a believer. And he was kind of skeptical about asking people to pray, and I don't know whether God's going to do it. But I love, uh, did you ever hear the Winston Churchill speech? Where, we will fight in the field, and we will fight in, in the streets, but we will never surrender. That was the spirit of the British people. King George said, we will pray. We will pray for God's deliverance. So back at Dunkirk, the, the clouds are swirling around, hiding the English army from the Nazis, but they're still backed up to the sea. How do we get the people off the beach of France and get them back to England? The army. If we lose the army, we lose the war. So King George, King George said, let the word go out to everyone with anything that could float to go to France and save our boys. So they got every pleasure craft they could. They got uh, yachts, they got canoes, they got rowboats, they got anything. Most of these didn't have compasses. None of them were armed. And they, they floated to France. It looked, they say, like uh, rush hour on the interstate. You could walk from boat to boat. There were so many boats. But the Germans couldn't see them. And so wouldn't it have been wonderful to have been an English soldier wondering how in the world are we going to be saved from this utter annihilation at the hands of the Nazis? And you look to the sea, and from the sea comes swarms of boats to rescue you. Wouldn't that have just been amazing? So what happened on the English Channel? Normally, the, this is another miracle. Normally, in the English Channel, 
it's very turbulent, it's stormy. The English Channel is historically a stormy channel, sea. But during this time for days, it was as smooth as your bathtub. And the English people were able to rescue their brothers and sisters who were fighting the Nazis and bring them back to England. 338,000 soldiers were rescued from certain death by canoes and yachts and pleasure craft and the Brits who had refused to give up and had, and had followed the edict of the king saying to pray and then to go. Now isn't that amazing? The king said to pray. Our king, Jesus Christ, says to pray. Our king, Jesus Christ, says to go into all the world and preach the gospel. So when we follow what the people in authority as they are issuing godly commands, as we do that, God will bless that. So we've all heard about the Battle of Dunkirk, but I don't think you've probably heard it in quite this way. That God, the things that are impossible in the world, are very, very possible with God. So those are a couple of the miracles I want to talk about today. So that was back in World War II. I am going to tell you about some personal miracles that I've witnessed that uh, we saw God's hand move. I was on the board of directors of a men's ministry in Bend, Oregon called the Shepherd's House, which is a homeless ministry. Uh, there was a disease going through the Shepherd's House that nobody could explain that were making people very, very ill. We were told by the health department that you either have to, these people, these men either have to get better or we're going to shut you down. Now this was in the middle of winter. So if we, because to stop the spread of the disease, we can't have these people uh, gathering together in close quarters to spread the disease. So if we have to shut your shepherd's house down, the men will just have to go out to the streets. So we put together a prayer team and we said, we believe God. We believe God does impossible things. Things that are impossible for man are very possible with God. So we prayed for God's healing of these men. Some of them were quarantined in um, uh, motels and hotels. Now, some of these men we're praying for were not very nice men, okay? There are people that say, well, if you're not nice and if you don't obey what God says, then God won't heal you. We were praying for men who were violent, who were angry, who were cursing at us, but we were still praying for them. We never figured out what this disease was, but one thing happened. The disease stopped. All of the men got better. Nobody got sick. And we were able to, we, to keep the shepherd's house open and continuing to serve the men, homeless men of Central Oregon. So praise God for that movement of his hand. And sometimes faith is believing in things you don't see. Now God didn't show up with an angel and say, I'm healing the shepherd's house. So all will know this is the act of God. That didn't happen. But as Christians, as the board and, and our prayer warriors were going out and praying and seeing this miracle happen, we saw it. We saw it with our own eyes. And we told people and they would say, okay, well, it just happened. It's just, you know, you know, you Christians always say that God does all this stuff, but it just, they just got better. We'll leave it open. But, and so back at the church, we're saying, praise God. Because this only happened because we prayed. Um, tell you another miracle that happened. Uh, we were, uh, this is a friend of mine. Their son took a heroin overdose in a electronic store bathroom, died, rushed into the hospital, brain dead. So we prayed and we prayed. We prayed for two straight weeks for two hours a day in one hour sessions. The hospital allowed us to go into the cubicle at the ER and pray for this man. This man's brain was swelling. You could see the swelling coming up his neck, his eyeballs, and so on and so forth. We continued to pray. 
that God would heal him or that God's will be done. And we prayed and we prayed. A question is often asked to me, how long do you pray and at what point do you stop praying? My answer is you pray until something happens. So we were committed to as long as they let us come in, and even if they didn't let us come in, we'll continue to pray outside the window where we're going to seek God for a miracle in this young man's life. So we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed some more. And they said, well, we're going to have to take him off life support because we're getting to the point where we're going to, it's been two weeks now, and there's no change in his behavior. We continue to pray. So one night, the husband and the wife, mother and father of the boy, and a nurse were in the room. And all of a sudden, a bright light flashed in the room. And the nurse turned to the mother and father and said, I don't know what's going on here, but there's nothing, the curtains are drawn, there's nothing in this room that would cause a bright flash of light like that. I don't know what it is. A second light flashed. I don't know what's going on, but something is happening, she said, and I can't explain it. This young man did go and did pass away. We believe he's in the presence of God. We believe the bright flashes of the lights were God saying in his compassion and grace, I hear you. I hear you. I wanted you to know I hear you. For whatever reason, the boy was not healed. We hope and pray that he was not a Christian before he took heroin. We pray that he accepted Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't know the answers to our prayers. Sometimes we, by faith, just proceed and pray. And the Bible says to be diligent in prayer and to believe that God, with all, with God, all things are possible. We are living in a time in our nation, in our world today, where we have to, do you really believe that Jesus Christ is God? Do you really believe the Bible is true? Do you really believe in God? Or is this just a fairy tale? God will reward the faith of those who follow him. We've mentioned several instances today, and I've got, I've got other stories to share with you because I've got other time. Again, Pastor Ed will be back, uh, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. We had a ministry in Bend, Oregon. We did a lot of things in Bend, Oregon, some of which I will reference. One of those was a healing service. We prayed for people to come in and be healed, not because of us or anything we did. I think it's really important that you approach God with a contrite and a humble spirit when you ask for, for prayer for healing. There are some people that say, well, you go in and demonstrate your faith by demanding a healing in the name of God. If you say the name of Jesus and you demand it, then healing will happen. Not always. I have seen it not happen. So we go in with a contrite heart and a humble spirit and say, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And thine be the power of glory forever and ever and ever amen on earth as it is in heaven lord we are coming forward and, and touching the hem of your garment and we ask for you and your grace and compassion to heal this person so where this is this is the the spirit in which we prayed for, prayed for healing and we saw some healings uh, a man whose shoulder had been his uh, rotator cuff had been torn last time it had been torn it took six months to heal his wife drug him into the church, kicking and screaming, saying, I'm in intense agony. The only way my wife will shut up is if I have you lame-brained Christians pray for me. Because I'm hurting so bad and because I'm tired of you nagging me, I will bring her to your church and you guys do your thing. I don't know if you sacrifice animals or whatever you do, but do your thing. Just get it over with because I'm hurting so bad. I, I'm tired of hearing my wife nag, 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 nag. I don't believe in this, but just do your thing so she'll shut up. Shut up. Okay? No, we don't kill animals. We'll just pray for you. And we'll answer any questions you have. So we prayed for this man. The following Sunday morning, before the church service, the phone rings. And it's this man. He says, do you remember me? 
I said, uh, yeah, what's your name? He said, no, no, I'm the guy with the shoulder. And I said, okay, what, can I pray for you again? No, no, no. He said, God healed me. I believe. And I said, okay, what brought about this change in heart? He said, I woke up the next morning. I had full motion in my shoulder, no pain, nothing. It's totally gone. It doesn't hurt a bit. And he said, I don't believe this garbage, but God healed me. And I just wanted to tell you, and I said, go and tell your friends. That's exactly what happened in the Bible. People would go up to Jay and say, Jesus, you healed me. And Jesus would say, go tell your friends. Go tell your friends. So that's our answer to, to that. Now, does, did everyone we prayed for get healed? No. Did some people we pray for die? Yes. You just heard one example of that. But one of the things that I do and that they did in the early church was Moses and early leaders of the church said, when God does something amazing in your life, build a monument. And when you look at that monument, you'll remember what God did to save you on that day. And your children will say, what's that monument for? And you'll say, this is where God parted the Red Sea. This is where God did this. This is where God helped us in the battle of whatever. Build a monument. So you'll remember God did that. So what I do in my life is I have these mental monuments where I remember these stories. I was there. It happened. Nobody can tell me it didn't because they weren't there. I was. So when we go in and we pray for cancer, when we pray for impossible situations, what I say is, God, I remember this, is, this instance in my life where, you, where we prayed and you moved, and I stand on the faith that I have from that event, and I know you hear my prayers. And so we press in for the miracle. But we never demand healing, never demand healing. Always approach the king with a humble spirit, realizing that God made man in God's image. Man did not make God in man's image. We have to make sure that we get that right, and we have to make sure that we honor God. Um, the impossible situations of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to share some scriptures with you. Let's see. Which other stories should we what should we share? Uh, let me share some personal. Let me share. Let me uh, share a story about a snowmobile trip that I took on. Uh, I was working for a company once that, w when you have a snowmobile in uh, dangerous situations, you're supposed to have a buddy on your snowmobile ride. The company I was working with could not afford a second person, so I went in often by myself, often in deep prayer. I went off the side of a mountain one time on my snowmobile and went down into a grove of trees. And the sled was, it was, the snow was 10 feet deep. The snow was down the side of the hill. And uh, I had to go up through this grove of trees. And I wasn't I, that good at a snowmobile that, that day. I wasn't as good as I am now. I'm a pretty, pretty adept snowmobiler now, but I wasn't then. So I said, God, it's you and me. There's nobody here. Cell phone service doesn't hurt, work. The only way I'm going to get out of this situation is if you help me. So I turned the snowmobile around, started it, grabbed onto it, and hit the gas. And the snowmobile drugged me, zigzagged up through the grove of trees to the top of the hill. I got to the top of the hill, I stopped, and I realized I hadn't hit anything. And I looked at back down through the grove of trees, and the snowmobile had zigzagged through the grove of trees to get me to the top of the hill. And the only thing I can remember seeing was the seat of the snowmobile because I was hanging on as it was dragging me. That is the God we serve. That is the God we serve. Uh, some scriptures I want to share with you about never giving up. The Word of God, and we shared several examples with you today about the power of prayer, about the power of faith, about how God moves miraculously in people's lives when they show faith. Excuse me. I'm going to share scriptures about not giving up. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through him 
who strengthens me. Angus Buchan believes it. James Money believes it. I believe it. Hopefully you do as well. Jason Lee believed it. Members of the Bitterroot, Salish, Flathead tribes believed in the book of heaven because God showed up and in a dream to their uh, chiefs said, go get the Bible from the white man. You didn't hear that in school, did you? It happened. Look it up. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I love it how God uses examples of threes in the Bible. What is good, what is acceptable and perfect to the will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. There are certain scriptures that now just jump off the page. We've all grown up in church hearing these scriptures recited over and over and over and over and over again to the point where sometimes they lose meaning. But there are times that God provides in our lives where those scriptures have deep meaning. Because as the world is trying to change us into a definition of something that is very ungodly, Romans chapter 12 verse 2 tells us another thing. It says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We are in a time today in the world where we are presented the same question that Jesus presented Peter. The disciples were gathered around and Jesus was talking to them. Who do? What does the world say that I am? Who does the world say that I am? Well, some say you're a disciple. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're a great teacher. And Peter jumps up and says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. And Jesus responding, Blessings, blessing on you, Peter, for you did not learn this from mortal men, but my, from my Father who is in heaven. And you, Peter, are the rock on which I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I believe that is one of the launching points of the church on this earth today. It wasn't Peter and his humanness that was being built in the church. It was the proclamation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God that was the launch point for the church of Jesus Christ. Blessing on you, Peter, for you did not learn this of mortal men, but from my Father who is in heaven. And on you, Peter, I will give keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Isn't it amazing to me, it's amazing to me that God, in his grace and compassion, wants us to somehow be involved in the working out of the gospel on the earth today. Now that's saying, I say that and say this very quickly, that it's not for our glory or our fame or fortune that we're doing this, but it is to grow the kingdom of God. In the early days when Eve bit the apple and God showed up, one of the things that God said was that the heel of the man will crush the serpent. And as we jump ahead to Revelations, the prayers of the saints will be poured out in the last days as part of the coming of the Messiah and the second coming. Isn't it amazing to me that a God who doesn't need us to, he could just say, well, this human thing didn't really work out like I thought it would. We'll just erase it all and start over and do something else. He doesn't do that. But in his compassion and grace, we are part of this work. We are part of furthering the kingdom of God. But we always should remember 
that he is God and we are not. But in believing in him, miracles happen. We don't worship the miracles, but we worship the God, and the miracles happen as a benefit of that. I think it's important in the, in the church today that we get that straight. We're not here to have Holy Spirit parties. We're not here to create a spectacle of war worship services. We are here to proclaim the peace and love and grace and the impossible possibilities of God. That is why we are here. So we have come to know and to believe that love God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received the commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice to Cain. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. In this day, when things are being redefined for us, where do we go for our definitions of family, of faith, of goodness, of love? We go to the Word of God. We go to the Bible. How do we know that the Bible is accurate? One of my good friends, in fact, a member of the board of our ministry, is Greg Gilbranson, and he is a biblical archaeologist. Everything they have dug up in Israel points to the validity and the credibility credibility of the Word of God. Everything as far as uh, courtyards and steps and colonnades uh, that were defined and described in the Bible has been proven by biblical archaeology. Praise God. Praise God. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. I love God, the power of three. I, I love the times in the word of God where God mentions things in threes. It's the fingerprint of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Romans 12, 12. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Angus Buchan knows it. James Money knows it. Soldiers from the Battle of Dunkirk know it. Jason Lee knows it. Hopefully you know it as well. And to those who are going through trials and tribulations today who need a healing in their physical body, Pray to God. And no matter what happens, keep praying. It's been asked to me, when do I stop praying? Or how do I know that I've prayed enough? When do I stop? And my answer is, with a smile, you never do. You keep praying. You keep praying. And so, oh, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work to pray to God all the time. I'll say, well, do you, do you get tired of talking to your friend? Oh, no, that's my friend. That's my buddy. Well, why can't you treat God the same way? You don't get tired of talking to your friend. Why should we get tired of talking to God? God is our faithful companion. God is God, and there's taking away nothing but that from that. But remember back in the Garden of Eden, it says in the Bible that Adam walked with God as a friend walked with a friend. Often people have this idea of God as Zeus with a anger complex, that he's up there. In fact, a lot of insurance policies say uh, act of God created this disaster or catastrophe. That's not the God we serve. Bad things do happen to good people. But Jesus Christ came to restore this relationship, came to restore this, this attitude of walking with a friend. 
Adam walked with God as a friend walked with a friend in the garden. Jesus came to restore that relationship so that we could call God friend. He is our God, and we pray to him, and we come to him with a humble and contrite heart and humble spirit when we ask for healing. But as you look at all the times that God approached people who were in sin in the Bible, the woman caught in the act of adultery, the woman at the well, the woman at the well was despised by the contemporaries of her time. But this man is talking to a Samaritan woman? How can this be? Because God loves her and wants to restore this friendship act of the gospel. If you've never thought about God being a friend or God being friendly in his relationship with you and the things he does in your life, pray about it. Uh, one, of the, one of the websites we really like to use a lot is called openbible.info, O-P-E-N-B-I-B-E-L-E dot I-N-F-O. You go there, go there and type in friend or not giving up or prayer, and out of that, uh, you'll get 100 scriptures that talk about references to that subject. But, so do that, but also have a daily time where you open up the Bible. What I do on my smartphone is I have two Bible apps, and I open those up and I read the Word of God. If I'm got a break at work, at lunchtime, whatever, I just open it up and talk to my friend. Jesus wants to be your friend. At the end of days, yes, Jesus will be our judge, and we will have to answer to the acts we've done on the earth today. But God also wants to be your friend. God walked with Adam as a friend walks with a friend. If you don't remember anything else I've said today, remember that. That God loves you. Yes, there are consequences for sin. And yes, we will have to answer for those at the end of the day. But Mark chapter 11 verse 24 says this, the promise of God. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. Romans 12, 12. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. So today we had a history lesson. Today we had an example of how some people um, prayed to God and believed God for impossible situations. We are living in a time in our nation where things seem to be impossible. But we as Christians worship a God of the impossible who can make impossible things possible. And that is the God we serve. That God defines our character. That God defines how we live our lives. That God defines what we do in society. And that is the definition of who we are and how we act and how we live in this nation today. So let's close in prayer. As we're getting, it's getting lunchtime and um, I'm getting hungry. And maybe next Sunday we'll have, we'll have another history lesson. We'll, we'll just come in and see what God has to say to us today. Pray for Pastor Ed and he and his wife, Ruby, uh, have a joyful trip uh, in the Midwest. Lord Jesus, as the Apostle Paul prayed, let these not be basically words from a man, not the persuasive words of a man, but from God. And Lord, let us not revel or glory in the fact that we're saying these words, but let us just use these words to show there is a friend you have, and the friend is Jesus Christ. There is a friend in Jesus. May these words be used to expand the kingdom of God. Holy Spirit, take these words and grow the kingdom and touch men's and women's hearts and let them know that there is a way. In the early church, following Jesus Christ was called the way. Let us return to the early church as far as their example of discipleship, as far as their example of having to live, as far as their example of believing in God for impossible situations, even for the bringing of food into our mouth. For God is God. Lord, be blessed.
this day. Bless your people. Encourage your people in this time of trials and tribulations in America today. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. See you next Sunday.